thanks so much for joining me again. In this photo editing tutorial, we're gonna take a look at exposure blending. If you shoot a lot of architecture or landscapes, you'll know that oftentimes one frame just isn't enough to capture the whole dynamic range right through from the shadows through to the highlights. So what do you do? Well, as I've shown in some of my other videos, HDR software is a good solution. But what if you want to do it manually and have a whole heap more control over the process? Well, that's what we're looking at in this video. So let's get to it. The other day I was working on a photograph of this waterfall here in New Zealand and the problem was that the highlights in the waterfall itself just weren't captured in one frame. There was a lot of deep dark shadows and this is intended to be going to print to go up on somebody's wall. So I wanted the viewer's eye just to be interested and intrigued by any single area they looked at on that photo. I didn't want areas of just pure blackness or shadows that were so deep that you couldn't see into them and so I wanted to create a base layer that I can work from that's just got all the detail I need. So I'm going to work on a different shot of the same waterfall but show you the process that I went through in order to combine a highlight, a shadow and a base layer into one so we've got a beautiful high dynamic range throughout that image. This shot here is just taken from if we look at this little bit here I was just have my tripod and everything set up here and I'm looking through this little area just here and that's giving me this frame here. We have our five exposures. This is what I would call my base exposure. This is two stops underexposed, one stop underexposed here and then we have one stop overexposed and then two stops overexposed in terms of where I started from. But in actual fact this two stops overexposed in terms of the foliage I much prefer this the green has got a nice rich color maybe it's just a little bit too hot a little bit too bright but I really like that whereas as you can see we have lost all detail whatsoever in the waterfall and if we come to one of the exposures let's say this middle one here uh, where we can see all of the fronds of the water coming over I really like the waterfall here, it's a little dark, but the actual shape of it and the texture of the water flowing over, I think with that one second exposure that you can see we've captured here, I think that looks really nice. So what we could do is combine two exposures into one, but I'm actually gonna use three. I like to have one that's my base exposure, one for my highlights and one for my shadows. So this is gonna be our base exposure. Let's get this looking how we want it to. This isn't a video based on the treatment that we're doing in Lightroom, so I'm just gonna take a shortcut and use my basic import all, and that's just gonna give us a pretty quick starting point. From here, I just want to make sure that my color balance I'm happy with. Uh, let's just ease off the temperature slightly so that the greens look a little more green, and even the tint we could push into that greeny tone just ever so slightly. I want this particular image to be as part of a series with this one, so I'm trying to be mindful of the green hue and just trying to get that to kind of be similar and match what we had going on here. Now I've got this photo at a point I'm happy with, I'm just gonna synchronize that across the rest of the series by shift clicking the end one and coming to sync and clicking synchronize and we've basically got everything checked. So everything such as the white balance that we just changed, that's all synchronized across these photos. So looking at this water here, I'm definitely happy with the shape of this waterfall. So let's work on that. Basically, we're going to be bringing in this area of this photo in Photoshop over the top of the blown out water here. So what we need to do is get the surrounding areas to match pretty much closely whilst maintaining the detail that we like in the waterfall. So let's boost the exposure slightly. Let's protect the highlights a little bit by bringing that down. Maybe even bring the exposure up even more. We can see that we're bleaching out to white just on this little hot area here. And what I'm also going to do is just bring in a new radial filter that I'm just gonna put over the top there. And this particular filter will just reduce the highlights there. And you can see if we push it too far to the left, things get a bit dirty and muddy. But what we can do is actually just feather that effect off so it's less intense. And now we can just bring that back to a point where we feel happy with it. We're also bleaching out at the bottom of the waterfall here. So if we just duplicate this and bring it down, we can now rotate at the edge to make that nice and flat and widen this effect just so that that covers that really bright area there. 
And now I'm just going to come into the curves and just boost the mid-tones up a little bit. So let's grab the middle of this curve here. There we go, that's brightening everything up and we're just not bleaching out any of the whites. We've got everything that we want here in the waterfall. And if I zoom in, yeah, we've got lovely detail in that waterfall. That's looking great. So now we know that we've got the waterfall area that we're ready to combine with this image where we really like the coloring of the foliage. But one thing I don't like is how some of the shadows around this area here, particularly towards the edge of the frame, they just drop off into complete blackness. Just so I know which images I'm working with, I'm just gonna click P on my keyboard. So I have picked this image. I've also picked this exposure for the waterfall, but what I'm gonna do is actually duplicate this one or create a virtual copy, sorry. Um, and this one is going to be for the shadows only. So if we come into the basic tab here and we can just boost the shadows all the way up. We're also gonna bring the blacks up as well. Now I'm not concerned that everything's looking a little bit like ugly HDR at the moment, that's not my concern. My concern is just bringing out detail in these areas here. I'm gonna come into the tone curve and I'm also gonna boost these shadows up just a little bit from here as well. I really wanna make sure that I can drop in all of that detail and we'll just protect the highlights as well so it blends in more seamlessly. You'll see how that works shortly in Photoshop. So now within Lightroom, we've developed the three different photo layers I want to work with and combine in Photoshop. We just need to select those layers. So I control click on each one. And now I'm going to right click and go to edit in and open a smart object in Photoshop. Photoshop has now opened these three files separately and because they are done as smart object, if I want to make any adjustments to them as layers, I have all that raw data still baked into that layer. It's a really nice non-destructive way to work. So the next thing I need to do is get them into one stack, one file that we can work on. So I'm just gonna drag these out into the area here and I'm just gonna hold the shift key with my move tool and I'm just gonna pull them all into one file there like that. We'll close these other two down. We don't want to save those. And let's just redock this up here. And we are going to change that to a medium gray so it's a little easier on the eye. Let's rename our layers. And my bottom layer I always call base. It's just how I work. Then we have a shadows layer and that's gonna fill in all the shadows and we have a waterfall layer or a highlights layer, and that's gonna take care of the waterfall. So for most people, an image like this may be good enough. Uh, you may be happy just to work on this file, but I really like to expand the dynamic range. So we've got detail right through from our very brightest highlights all the way through to our shadows. Then once we've got that layer, we're just much more free to push and pull the photograph in the direction we want to go. So how do we hide and reveal the elements of each layer that we want to keep. Well, it all comes down to masking. One method would be to create a mask where we just hide everything and then we just paint back in the areas we want to reveal. But there's a much, much better way and more accurate way to do it. And let me show you that. Let's hide both of these layers. I think the first thing we'll do is bring back the waterfall. So let's put that just above the base layer. And we're going to click the mask button here. So we've got a mask and just come to image, apply image. Click that. With the default settings that we've got here, we're cr basically creating a black and white version of this onto the mask. So as you know, with masks, black conceals, white reveals. So where the mask is white here, we are going to see the waterfall from this layer. So let me click OK, and then we'll view this layer. And now you can see that where that mask is predominantly white, we're seeing most of this waterfall coming through here. Now the dulling down of the rest of the photo, where we've got white elements or, or light gray elements around the waterfall, that's not really of interest to me. So we're basically going to do a technique called double masking, and that involves creating a folder and dropping this photo, this layer, sorry, into this folder. 
And now we can create another mask on top of this. So here's our mask. If we fill that with black, I'm just gonna press Alt and delete. That has got rid of everything that we just worked on uh, to reveal that waterfall. So now what we can do is using a white brush, and this is where we can paint very haphazardly. We can, let's crank the opacity to 100%. We can just paint over the top of this. And that mask that we were was so fine-tuned underneath is being revealed just over the waterfall area. So now we are only affecting the waterfall, and that is much, much better. We can refine that mask slightly if we want to, but overall, I'm pretty happy with that. So this is our before, and this is our after. And now we're able to do exactly the same thing again with the shadows. So if we look at our shadow layer here, you can see that there's not too much that we want to really bring in, but it's basically where all of the darkest areas are in this photo, and pretty much uh, they just appear to the eye to be pretty much just black holes. There's no detail there, and I really want to be able to work with some of that detail. Sure, I might keep that quite dark in the final print, but I do want to have the detail there. So unlike with the previous layer, where we wanted to actually reveal the highlights, here we want to reveal the shadows. So how do we do that? Let's create another mask and come up to Image, Apply Image again. And as you can see, just like in the last example, we have a brighter waterfall, because that was the brightest part of the image, and uh, blackness around here where all these shadow areas are. So we want the opposite of that. So what we can do is actually invert the mask. And now you can see this is flipped to be white where the shadows are. So that's gonna reveal that in this area. I can click OK. And if we turn this on now, we can see that those shadow areas are suddenly coming through. And that's what I want. However, in this particular example, I feel like it's a little bit too much over the whole picture. If I Alt click or Option click on the Mac on this layer, you can see what it looks like. And there is an awful lot of white in this mask. So that means that where it's white and light gray, we're basically seeing everything from this layer. And for me, that's just too much. There's a couple of ways that we can handle this. We could use image, go to adjustments, and we could either use levels or curves on this. So if we brought in a curves layer, we can just start to bring the curve down so that we're seeing less of those shadows, basically where it's white, which there isn't as much anymore, that's where we're gonna see the shadows. So that's a great option. If we click the eyeball tool again, we can see now that now we're just getting those shadows exactly where we want them and not over the whole picture. And now the great thing with this is, if you feel that the image has become a little washed out, a little bit too flat because you have boosted the shadows, because you've dropped down the highlights, you have the option, because we're working with smart objects, which is basically all of that raw data, we can come back in and change things after the event. So I've double clicked on our base layer here and I can use Adobe Camera Raw to basically control this. If I feel that it was just a little bit too bright, I can drop that brightness down. If certain areas within this photo are also too bright, like I feel like this foreground rock is just a little bit too bright, I can use a radial filter, draw that over there and just drop the exposure of just that one area. If I want to do the same on the other side, I can duplicate it and drag it over as well. Maybe that side doesn't need to be quite as dark. Okay, I'm getting lost in the minutia here, but let's click OK. And perhaps the waterfall itself is just lacking a little bit of contrast. So what we can do is double click on the waterfall layer, zoom in a little bit, just so we're seeing more of our waterfall. And again, we can use Adobe Camera Raw just to sort of finesse this image. Let's boost those whites. We've got a warning on here, so if we push the whites too far, we can see that we're actually bleaching those out. But we want to head somewhere around there. I'm not, I'm not worried too much if we push just a little too far on that. We can control it with the highlights. And let's pull our blacks down a little bit too. How about if we play with the clarity? That's going to increase local contrast as well. Yeah, let's push the clarity up just a smidge from where it was. Click OK. And there we go, we've got just a little bit more contrast in the waterfall itself. It doesn't look exactly like it did on the layer because obviously we are masking this. And if I Alt or Option click on that mask again, you'll see exactly how we're masking this area. 
So if that went over your head just a little bit before, um, let me explain that in a little bit more detail. Basically, you can't add two masks to one layer normally. So a workaround for that is basically to put the, put the layer into a group. And now we can grab it, put it in there. And now this group itself can have another mask. So if we add another mask there, nothing changes because the mask is currently white and that is revealing everything, so no different. But if we fill it with black, and I'm gonna use Alt Delete, and that fills with our foreground color, which is currently black. And now using white and a paintbrush, I can basically paint back in only where I want to reintroduce detail into the shadows. So as you can see here and here, here comes some details in the shadow, whoop de woo and I really like this method of double masking because it gives you a lot of control to paint back in just what you want. Um, like for that bit there, I just felt like that washed things out just a little bit. So I can press Control Z and undo that. I can uh, paint it in with a 50% opacity if I want to. So if I want a little bit of that effect, but not fully, uh, we can do the same up there. And as we come down here, I'm going to make my brush bigger just by pressing the right bracket keys. And you can see straight away that we're boosting up this area, but we're not doing so in a way that kind of destroys the harmony of the contrast of the image. We're just talking into the shadows here, which is really nice to know that we can paint quite freely with our brush, but we're only affecting those shadows. And now maybe just underneath this rock here, and through into this area here as well. And now any changes I make beyond this with this particular image, I know that I've got a full dynamic range that I'm playing with. And that just gives me a whole host of creative freedom to play with this image however I want to now. And I know that I'm still gonna have detail in the shadows, detail in the highlights. I'm gonna have a really dynamic image that holds tonality throughout and it's gonna be a really beautiful print on the wall. Let me rename that so that we're nice and organized. I love to be organized. And we're just gonna close these two folders down and we can basically see where we've come from. So this is our original image with the waterfall very much blown out and no detail whatsoever in the shadows. We've then introduced some detail into the waterfall. If we feel that that is just a little bit too dampening in terms of the highlights, what you can do is you've got the freedom to play with the opacity so that you're not reintroducing it at 100%, but you might be saying, hey, I want to control those highlights. Let's go around that sort of like 70, 80% mark. Then we reintroduce the shadows. Again, oh, is it washing things out just a little bit too much? Oh, perhaps we can just reduce the opacity. And so now what we can do is create a stamped visible layer, which is basically taking all these three layers and combining them into one. So I've just pressed the monster shortcut key to create this layer here, which is Control, Shift, Alt and E or Control, Shift, Option E on the Mac. It's a killer massive shortcut, but it's such a good shortcut. So if I hide the three layers or every layer, uh, we now have just one layer, which is a combination of what we've just done. Fantastic. Hopefully that process wasn't too complex for you. If it was a little bit difficult to understand, please just go back and rewatch it because honestly, it's so important to add this to your editing arsenal. So the main key points are you're creating three different layers with different exposures. That's usually done in camera. We've got a highlight layer, we've got a shadow layer, and we've got our base layer. We then apply a mask to the highlight layer and the shadow layer. And we do this by using the apply image command. This then shows through just in the shadows or the highlights, depending whether you invert the mask or not. And then by putting that layer inside its own folder, you can then have a secondary mask that allows you just to paint back that effect exactly where you want it rather than through the whole image. That's it in a nutshell. I hope you've got that. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'm happy to help you guys out. If you love the idea of doing this manually, but it's just, eh, it's a little bit too time consuming or I don't quite understand it, I would certainly recommend using a really easy HDR bit of software, something like Aurora HDR. I found that one to be really good, create nice natural results, which is what you want. You don't want that like nasty HDR look. If you do want to go the HDR software route, I've got a discount code for that particular software, which is at Sky10, and you're welcome to use that at the checkout. I'll put a link to that one in the description below. 
and thank you so much for watching guys hope you're staying safe and well out there cheers see you in the next video